Hello, I'm Cheryl McCarthy. Welcome to One to One. Earlier this year, Virginia became the 38th state to ratify the Federal Equal Rights Amendment, which was approved by Congress almost 50 years ago and required ratification by 38 states. But will it become part of the Constitution, given that the deadline for state ratification passed 20 years ago? At a time when women's participation in virtually all walks of society has increased dramatically since the ERA was first proposed, do we even need an Equal Rights Amendment? Julie Sook is Professor of Sociology and Political Science at the CUNY Graduate Center. In her new book, We the Women, the Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment, she traces the tortured history of the ERA and argues that it should be allowed to become law. Welcome. Thank you so much. After the ERA was introduced in Congress in 1972, the deadline for the required 38 states to ratify it had expired by 1982. Yet during the last three years, three states finally ratified it. Uh, Virginia, the last one earlier this year. So isn't the, the ERA basically dead in the water? And if so, why are they bothering to ratify it at this point? When Congress adopted the ERA, the Constitution requires Congress, both chambers, to adopt a constitutional amendment by a two-thirds majority, and then for three-fourths of the states to ratify it. Uh, that's all the Constitution really says about what's required, uh, but it's become a normal part of proposing amendments that Congress actually puts a deadline on ratification. And, the, and Congress did that with regard to the ERA, when it adopted it in 1972. So the first deadline was 1979, and then Congress actually extended the deadline because by the time we got to 1978, only 35 states had ratified the ERA. So they extended the deadline to 1982, but no additional states ratified it by that time. Uh, and it was forgotten uh, for almost four decades. And uh, there was a revival of the ERA in 2017, where Nevada ratified, and then the following year, Illinois ratified, and this year, Virginia ratified, bringing us up to the magic number, 38 states, which would constitute three-fourths of the states. So the reason the three states that have ratified uh, decades after the last deadline, uh, they've done so because they think that the ERA remains relevant because of the inequalities women still face in American society, and the hope that enshrining constitutional equality in the, um, in the Constitution itself uh, will uh, make a difference to that. Uh, do you think with regard also, to, yeah. Do you think it also has something to do is that right now we have a lot more women in the state legislatures so that they could push it through in the last three years? Yes, I think that's definitely driving uh, why it's happening. Uh, but there is also, there's an understanding, just going to your last question about the deadline, uh, because Congress imposed the deadline uh, in 1972, but already changed it once, uh, the precedent that we have suggests that Congress has complete control over deadlines, including the power to change a deadline. And that means Congress has the power to remove the deadline now. And the House also, the House of Representatives in Congress has a record number of women and women of color elected since 2018. And the House took action earlier this year, right after Virginia ratified, uh, to actually remove the deadline altogether. And so if both houses of Congress remove the deadline, uh, that would seem to be sufficient uh, to make the ERA part of the Constitution. Now. So it really seems up to the Senate, correct? Yes, okay. yes. And there are 48 sponsors in the Senate uh, so very close, but obviously not a majority. Uh, and there is bipartisan support. The bill uh, in the Senate that would remove the deadline uh, is sponsored by a Republican and a Democrat. Although the, the Trump administration, is, the Trump administration's position is that the ERA is dead. So um, it's, it's possible that if he is reelected again, if the, if the Republicans still have a majority in the Senate, that they could kill it off for good, correct? Well, not exactly, because the Trump administration's position came in a uh, Office of Legal Counsel memo to the Justice Department, and it's really just the Trump administration's opinion. Under the Constitution's rules for amending the Constitution, the president plays no role. 
And actually the executive branch plays no role. Uh, the only players in making a constitutional amendment under Article 5 of the Constitution are Congress and the states. Uh, so really it's up to Congress to decide, since Congress is the one that came up with the deadline in the first place, uh, the deadline imposer has to decide what the consequence is of missing the deadline. Uh, and one option, of course, is for Congress to, to, to say it's just too late. Uh, but uh, another very important option is for Congress to say it's not too late at all. This amendment remains relevant and important to the American people. So uh, we're not going to get it. We're not going to get an ERA, certainly with this Congress, but it's possible that we could get it with a new with a new with this Senate, but it's possible that we could get it with a new Senate, correct? So if the House of Representatives re retains its current composition in terms of, and I don't, it's not totally partisan. There are Republicans in the House who voted uh, for the ERA uh, then, and there are Republicans in the Senate who support the ERA, including uh, Senator Lisa Murkowski from Alaska. So if the Senate were to change its composition in this next election and many, many seats are up for grabs, I believe that in the next session of Congress, uh, regardless of who the president is, it's very possible for the next Congress uh, to remove the deadline and that right. would legitimize the ERA. So here's what the Equal Right Amendments, Rights Amendment says. Equality of the rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. The Congress shall have the power to enforce by appropriate legislation the provisions of this article. Um, it's interesting that after women got the vote, could vote for the first time in 1920, uh, the ERA was one of the first items that the women activists put on their agenda. Um, why did they, now the Constitution already has a 14th Amendment, so, which supposedly um, provides uh, equal treatment for everybody. So why did the women activists feel that the ERA was necessary? Well, the 14th Amendment does provide for equal protection of the laws. It says no person shall be denied uh, the equal protection of the laws, but it was adopted after the Civil War. And section two of the 14th Amendment then talks about what would happen if any state were to deny African-Americans uh, the right to vote. And, um, and in section two of the 14th Amendment, they talk about male inhabitants and males uh, as voters. Um, so there's an assumption, even as the 14th Amendment is declaring equality and using the word person, there's an assumption in the very same amendment uh, that really it's only the men who are voting and only the men who are counted for the purposes of apportionment. Uh, and it's that assumption that, that gets tested uh, in the 1870s in a case called Minor versus Happersett, uh, where uh, it's proposed uh, in litigation that women are, are citizens and now have the right to vote. Uh, and the Supreme Court says in that case, well, voting is not really a privilege or immunity of citizenship. And there are other cases in the late 19th century uh, that where the Supreme Court uh, upholds laws that exclude women from the legal profession. A woman who passes the bar exam tries to become a lawyer in Illinois. Uh, and the Supreme Court says that Illinois has every right to deny women uh, the, the possibility of becoming a lawyer. And so it's because of those interpretations of the 14th Amendment uh, that women believed that um, after the 19th Amendment, which really only talks about the right to vote, uh, you needed another amendment to ensure that women had equal rights in all things uh, beyond the right to vote. But very interestingly, not all the suffragists supported the ERA when it was introduced. In fact, there was a real split because some of the suffragists thought that a new an additional amendment should be the first thing they should focus on. A lot of the suffragists uh, including the League of Women Voters, which was, voted, um, which was formed uh, out of uh, the largest suffrage organization, the National American Women Suffrage Association, NASA. Uh, those groups actually did not get behind the ERA and focused on actual legislation that would help women, including legislation to reduce maternal mortality. And that was actually uh, much higher on the agenda for many of the former suffragists. There was some state legislation that protected the rights of women. And weren't they afraid that it would, the ERA would make things equal again and you would no longer have these special protections for women 
few though they were. Yes, that's exactly right. Because the problem was that they were in a legal and political context. And um, that legal and political context was one where the Supreme Court was very conservative at that moment. And the Supreme Court had been striking down a lot of laws that were designed to protect the health and safety of workers in general. Uh, but the Supreme Court had carved out this narrow exception for laws that helped women working in industry. They thought that since women didn't even have the right to vote, uh, they needed extra protection from exploitation. And what's very interesting is that in 1923, the same conservative Supreme Court struck down a law uh, and they cited the 19th Amendment. They said, since women are now equal, women don't need these special protections anymore. So they struck down a minimum wage for women. And one of the immediate effects of that uh, strike down was that women's wages plummeted. And so some of the social reformers who were active suffragists uh, in the 1920s were worried that if you got an ERA that you just handed over to a conservative Supreme Court majority, uh, the conservative Supreme Court majority would use that amendment uh, to strike down all kinds of things that were good for workers and good for women. Right. Uh, so the ERA was first introduced in Congress in 1923 and was, reduced, was introduced repeatedly until it was finally approved in 1972 by Congress. What were some of the barriers to its passage uh, by Congress? Obviously, one of them was there were very few women in Congress for a long time. Um, and uh, there was, I know there was opposition from Emanuel Seller, Congressman from New York of all places, who was chair of the uh, House Judiciary Committee who kept the ERA locked up in committee. So it was largely uh, people like him who were against the ERA, but they weren't all against the ERA because they were for labor rights. Many men in Congress were against the ERA because they did not want women to be equal. Right. Uh, under the law or now, in society. Now, Black women had some reservations about the ERA from the beginning as well. Uh, one thing, uh, Alice Paul, one of the authors of the, uh, the ERA, um, was perceived as racist. She had not allowed uh, Black women uh, to march up front or with the, with the white women during a, a, a women's march back in 1913. Uh, but there were other reasons Black women were skeptical about it as well? In the very beginning, it's not really clear where African-American women stood on the ERA in the 1920s and 1930s. But I think one moment that's extremely pivotal is that by the time you get to 1945, Mary Church Terrell, representing the National Association of Colored Women, testifies in Congress in favor of the ERA from the standpoint of African-American women's experience. And she especially points out that she thinks that the ERA would actually be helpful to women who have to work to support their families. And she speaks to the experience of African-American women uh, who have always worked. Uh, and they work because they have to support their families. And the ERA could offer something uh, to women who are struggling with disadvantages that they face uh, because they're juggling motherhood. Right, uh, so as she well came on work. board. What pressures finally pushed the ERA to ratification by the House and, and the Senate. In 1972, I, I think one thing, you've got the women's rights movement. Uh, you probably have a lot more women, or more people who are in Congress now. Uh, any other factors why it went across in 1972? Well, I do think that it's because there were women in Congress, although not too many. 2% uh, of Congress, it was really just 10 women in the House and one woman in the Senate. Wow. But the women in the House, including the first women of color who were elected, Patsy Mink, who's the first Asian American woman, Shirley Chisholm, who's the first African American woman elected to Congress, they really put their weight and were very vocal about the importance of the ERA. And Martha Griffiths, by 1970, 71, 72, when the ERA really gets off the ground, she was a seasoned Congresswoman, Martha Griffiths. And so even though the ERA was being held up in committee, she figured out a way to get it out of committee uh, by doing a discharge petition. So she used a parliamentary maneuver using her political acumen. So the growth of women in Congress uh, from the time that women get the vote until even now, it's, it's a very slow uh, growth of women, uh, but certainly not just the numbers, uh, but the political will and political skill um, of the women. 
Uh, and, and of course, they are supported by a large scale social movement. So the ERA is adopted at a moment when on the 50th anniversary of the suffrage amendment of the 19th amendment, uh, there is a huge women's march, not only in New York, but in multiple cities throughout the country, the Women's Strike for Equality, August 26, 1970, where women demand the ERA, they demand equal employment and educational opportunity, and then they also demand the changes in law and public policy necessary to make that equality real. So a real childcare policy uh, so that women can overcome disadvantage they, disadvantages that they face because of childbearing and child rearing uh, and uh, reproductive freedom because women say that unless they have some measure of control over when uh, to have children or whether to have children, uh, they will never actually be able to take advantage of any equal rights that the law grants to them. So you've got Congress, two thirds of the members of Congress who voted for it in 1972 and a whole bunch in the first year after it was passed by Congress, something like 30 states ratified it. Uh, That's right. And then it slowed down and uh, you're approaching uh, uh, the first deadline, first deadline. And uh, so there was a movement to try to extend the deadline. And there's a battle over whether the, uh, whether the deadline could be extended or not. Uh, but the women activists prevailed and it was extended until, was it 1982? Oh, until 1982. Um, so whether the uh, ERA can be added to the Constitution at this point. You know, as we said, it's, a, it's an open legal question. And some people, including the Trump administration, says, you know, you can't extend it. Uh, others argue that since the Congress uh, had the power to set the deadline and extend the deadline, uh, it has the power to say, ignore the deadline and we'll add it to the, uh, to the Constitution. And I happen to be, have been a former student of Ruth Ginsburg in her sex discrimination class. And, you know, who, who explained that basically the reason you needed ERA was because the uh, 14th Amendment had not been enough or, 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 or deemed enough, powerful enough to prevent a lot of discriminatory laws against women. And so you needed the ERA. But since that time, um, women have made so many strides since the ERA was first proposed. Um, and so the question becomes, why do we need it now? I'm so thrilled to hear that you were one of uh, the late Justice Ginsburg students uh, when she taught sex discrimination in the law, because I, and, and I think it is actually a really deep and important question uh, about constitutional change. The Equal Rights Amendment proponents in Congress, the lawmakers, uh, they weren't just interested in having an amendment that would be handed over to the Supreme Court to strike down laws that discriminated against women. Um, they were also very concerned that lawmakers be empowered uh, to enact laws, strike up laws, <laughs> Uh, right. that would get rid of disadvantages that existed, that would get rid of all the governmental practices uh, that were discriminatory in effect. Uh, and you couldn't do that just by getting courts to strike down existing laws. Um, you needed the political momentum uh, and legitimacy, uh, particularly to women who were being elected uh, to Congress and to state legislatures uh, to come up with real public policy solutions to the complex sources of women's disadvantage. Including so you thought, it, like so you thought it needed a kind of legal spur uh, to the state legislatures uh, on, on one hand to go through their laws and see which ones were discriminatory and if they were to get rid of them or pass new laws, right? Yes, that's exactly right. So if the ERA becomes part of the Constitution in the coming months, in the coming year, what do you expect to start happening the day after? So section three of the ERA says that it becomes effective two years after the date of ratification. Okay, so let's move up two so, years. So no, what, but I think the day, so no, but I'm, I'm gonna start with the day after. I think the day after, the, so the meaning of the two years, uh, it, it, it looks like something that 
no one should pay attention to. It's just like it come, becomes effective in two years. But if you look at what the proponents of the ERA said in the 1970s about that provision, the reason you needed that two years was so that uh, the legislatures in the states and Congress could roll up their sleeves and get to work. That's the time to review laws to see what kind of effect those existing laws have on women and what you need to change to make sure that women are truly equal citizens, equal in status to men. Uh, and so that means getting rid of and rewriting. Uh, and that's why the two year delay is there. So I think it does mean that once it's actually ratified, uh, that process uh, begins. Uh, and I think that process is extremely important and should not be ignored uh, because uh, after it becomes effective, uh, as a constitutional right, it becomes enforceable by judges and courts, and particularly uh, federal judges uh, and courts, as well as state courts. And it was, it was very interesting to follow what I, what I described as the torturous course of the, mm -hmm. of the ERA over time, because it really was torturous. Um, and, you know, a lot of things had to change over time, and women had to, and women uh, and, and one thing that you pointed out, um, your book highlights almost 70 women who were pivotal in getting the ERA to where it is now, starting way back with Abigail Adams and Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, the names that we know about, but a lot, a lot of other women who are not you know, household names. It, it talked about the contributions of, of all of those who fought for women's equality. And I thought that's one of the... Uh, great things and very interesting things that one gets from the book. Um, I'm afraid we're out of time, but I'd like to thank Julie Sook, Professor of Sociology and Political Science at the CUNY Graduate Center and author of We the Women, The Unstoppable Mothers of the Equal Rights Amendment, which has just been published by Skyhorse Publishing Inc. For the City University of New York and One to One, I'm Cheryl McCarthy.